Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the most recent webinar in the Dataversity monthly series, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy with Dr. Wendy Lynch. This series is held the first Thursday of every month and today, Wendy will be joined by Josh Reed, a data strategy, data literacy, data governance and delivery leader for Success Data or for Succeed Data and Bill Wood, Data Governance Officer for Health Trio to discuss data governance, data literacy and the management of data. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section. And to find the chat and the Q&A panels, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce our speakers for today with Josh. Josh helps organizations implement their data strategy and support data literacy programs. He's a trusted advisor and business partner with a contagious passion for data and consumer centricity. Experience driving small and large scale data and digital transformations and building governance practices. After spending 10 years in the Navy, Bill has spent many years working with all aspects of data in several industries, consulting, corporate training, healthcare, telemarketing, and pharmaceuticals. His passions are data quality, analytics, and visualization, and helping organizations learn how to best leverage and manage their data. He is currently the data governance officer at Health Trio, a software as a service provider for health insurance companies, and he's also organized several meetup groups for data governance, board games, and race relations. And with and let me introduce to you the speaker for our series, Dr. Wendy Lynch. Wendy is the founder of analytictranslator.com and Lynch Consulting. Over 35 years, she has converted complex analytics into business value. At heart, she is a sense maker and translator, a consultant to numerous Fortune 100 companies. Her current for work focuses on the application of big data solutions in human capital management. In 2022, she was awarded the Bill Whitmer Leadership Award for her sustained contributions to the science of corporate health. As a research scientist, Working in the business world, Dr. Wendy Lynch has learned to straddle commercial and academic goals, translating analytic results into market success. Through this experience, she has created her book, uh, Become an Analytic Translator, and an online course. You can find it at analytic-translator.com. And with that, I will give the floor to Wendy to start the presentation. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. And to all of you who are joining us the first time, welcome. For those of you who have been here before, welcome back. As Shannon said, today's topic is governance, literacy, and the management of data. And I have asked our panelists specifically to comment on the overlap between data literacy and data governance. I want to first start by talking about what I hear about data literacy. When people ask me about it or talk to me about it, they say, you know, we need people to be highly data literate because they say we need people to make data driven decisions. And I'm going to push back on that just a little bit. I would say that in our society today, Every single person, pretty much, who reads a paper or looks at the internet or scrolls through any of the things that they've subscribed to, they use data, depend on data, compare data, decide what to believe, react to data, debate data, celebrate the results of data. We use data all the time. In fact, we take for granted that we can depend on many, many things in life that what the time says is the time. When it's 70 degrees, we know what that's going to feel like. We know what day Christmas is coming. We know how far a mile is. We believe when the speedometer says we're going 55. We believe what the statement says in our bank account. We know we can lift a five pound dumbbell and we probably shouldn't lift a 50 pound one. And we know that if somebody holds the world record in the javelin, they probably threw it the farthest. That's because there are standards that we agree on. 
Certainly there may be exceptions, but there are standards about how far, how heavy, how hot, how cold, how fast, how slow, how much we depend on those. And because we depend on those, we're confident when we make comparisons. Today was colder than yesterday. My team scored more points than yours. Now there may be debates if maybe that touchdown was really on the line, if the foot was out of bounds, whatever, but no, we know what the rules are. We know when a job pays more. We know that the stock price was higher because we believe the Dow has an accurate metric. We believe when we've lost weight, it might be up or down a little bit on somebody's scale versus your scale, but we believe that we can measure these things because those standards are collected and applied consistently. We use data all the time. Almost every person makes data-driven decisions all day, every day, based on real time or predicted data even. It's supposed to rain on Sunday. 100% chance, so let's have the picnic on Saturday. Traffic is backed up on Google, so I'm going to go a different direction. Interest rates are down, so I'm going to start looking for a new house. Plane fares cost more in the summer, so I'm going to book for the fall. There's supposed to be an eclipse on May 3rd, so I'm going to go see it. Because there are trusted systems and authorities. We believe for the most part, I, I get it, meteorologists. We believe the astronomers. We believe the economists in general because we trust the sources and there is governance about how those data are tallied and measured and presented. I think what we're talking about is that people also make data-driven decisions from questionable sources. Apologies if any of you believe in these authorities, but we might have someone say the celebrity took ivermectin, so it must be safe. Politician says vaccines cause autism, so I'm not gonna get one. The product has a five-star rating, so I'm gonna buy it. Four out of five dentists say that Colgate is better. A person has a million followers on Instagram, so I'm gonna follow them too, they must be great. We make data-driven decisions, it's just maybe in some cases we misplace our trust or we're not quite sure how to assess the validity of that five-star rating. So I don't think we want to increase data literacy so that people can make data-driven decisions. I think they make data-driven decisions all the time. We want them to make effective, valid, accurate, reliable decisions because they're already using data. And because my brain works this way and I just like to think of things as analogies and trying to understand them, I would say, that there's a parallel. A person who has low nutritional literacy still eats. It's just they may choose differently than someone who has high nutritional literacy. Similarly, person who has low data literacy still consumes information. They just may choose and use that information differently. So if we continue with this analogy of food and data, when somebody is making a choice about what it is they are going to consume, whether that be information or some dish, we start to realize that there are parallel responsibilities. On the one hand, there need to be governing bodies who ensure that there is safety in food, that consumers are protected from known dangers, 
that there's consistency in what things are called or how they're measured or the process used in order to handle them or create them. And that there's enough transparency that we know what's in that food. Similarly, I mean, to a certain extent, you have to be responsible for what you decide to eat. And so we hope that consumers will take enough responsibility to understand the meaning of the information that they get about the food, whether that's an expiration date or whether it includes red dye number five. And some of you aren't old enough to know that reference, but it's if there is something dangerous in it or something that's dangerous to you personally, if there's peanuts in it and you have a peanut allergy, we have a certain amount of responsibility to understand as long as that information is given to us. And we probably need to know that we have a role in it. We have a role to understand what is in the packaging that tells us whether or not the salmon salad is what we need right now or the double cheeseburger is what we need right now. So if we think about this as a chain of production, we can start at the top. And governance about food starts with the collection or the sourcing of the food. Where did it come from? Was that salmon farmed or caught wild? Were those cows raised humane? And so we have to understand the collection and the sourcing at the very beginning. And then when it's transferred or transported, who handles it? Is it protected? Did it have any stops along the way? So what in the world do we need to know about it between the time it was sourced and then the time that it's actually transformed from its original format into the format that will be used by the consumer. And as we think about it, all of these steps also have to be collected in a way that we have enough information to make knowledgeable decisions about whether it's safe. And so we have to have transparency at every step of the way. So if we start on the other end, the total opposite end, um, we're just talking about eating or reading if we're thinking about data. If we just get the results and trust them no matter what, get the food and trust that it's gonna be great. And then for the most part, if we're lucky and we live somewhere where they, the governance oversees the food and for the most part, as long as you don't have something expired or damaged, it's gonna be great for you. But there's a step above that, which is in what format are you going to get that food or that data? Do you want that salmon in a salad? Do you want the salmon uh, grilled and uh, in, to go in a wrap? Do you want a cheeseburger to go or do you want it to eat in-house in the restaurant? And what do we need to know to make some of those choices? What kinds of things do we need to understand about the ingredients in order to make that decision about how to present it? And one step back is how did you prepare it or manipulate it? Whether this is analysts figuring out how to use the transformed data or whether this is the chef deciding whether to boil or fry or um, grill, we get to think about the steps from consumption all the way back to the choices that we make about handling it as the consumer. And if we think of it this way, you need more literacy to understand how to prepare it to be a good chef, to cook it right, to be able to read the recipe and understand it, then figure out how you're gonna deliver it and consume it. And so how much do we want 
people to be just getting the food versus learning how to actually prepare the food. And so if we think about that from the top of the chain down to the bottom of the chain, governance is pretty much involved in all of these steps to make sure that when we're gonna prepare it, it's prepared consistently and that the metrics we use are the same that they use at a different restaurant down the street and that we decide how to deliver it. All of those things are in governance. Consumption can just be at the very bottom or we can start to ask that people become more literate and get more and more involved in making good choices further up the food chain. We can also think of it as the difference between, look, I'll eat whatever you give me, versus I'll select and prepare what I'm going to eat based on what I know about the ingredients and where it came from and how well it was handled and whether it's safe. So with that analogy, it helps me think about this differently because it clearly defines what we mean by governance and then what roles we could have as consumers of information. But again, I would argue that a person who has low literacy still uses that information and probably makes data-driven decisions. It's just a question of whether they're using data they can trust or whether they're using data that they don't understand because they haven't learned to go back in the steps to understand it. So I invited Josh and Bill to join us today. And I gave them some uh, wide parameters and asked them to think about one of these questions. In what ways is there a disconnect between governance and literacy? Are there specific misconceptions that non-data people have about governance and could literacy help with that? What can data literacy efforts learn from governance and any other lessons that they may have learned? And so at this point, what I'll do is I'll invite Josh to um, give us a commentary on his perception of the overlap between governance and literacy. Hi, everybody. Can I share my screen now? Yes, please do. Right on. We'll get past the title page. I'm going to start off with um, the, the data literacy dilemma. Data literacy for me isn't necessarily the same thing for all of the people on today's call. It looks like I've shared the wrong screen. We see the data literacy dilemma. Good. Yeah. I'm just confused. Um, so I was hoping to get a show of hands today in the chat. Um, who here is really looking to learn about data literacy? If you, if you uh, can put your, your hand up, please do. With a thumbs up, that would probably work. Well, we got Shannon, so that's good. So the thumbs ups are starting to come in. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's the best one. Um, who here has actually already started a data literacy program? Can I get a, another thumbs up? And it looks like we've got a bunch of people that have that are in progress already. That's great. The last one is who is about to start? We have people that haven't started yet and they're here to learn and, and get ready for this. Uh, 
Okay, so we've got a mix. So it's going to be, I'm, I'm going to do my best to um, help everybody a little bit, but I'll, I'll try to stay away from as much detail as I can um, where, where it might be too deep. Um, this will probably be more of a verification on whether or not you're on the right path or even um, some things to think about, some speed bumps to be aware of along your journey. Um, what's clear is that um, the data literacy program for your specific organization isn't going to be the same in any other organization. I'm going to jump right into it and give you my view of where I think there are overlaps. And as I go through this, I'll talk about where I think there are disconnects between data governance and data literacy. And what may make my view a little bit different is I, I see data literacy from a, a, a capability perspective as a, a data governance capability. I believe it's something that data governance is responsible and accountable for. If there was a hierarchy, you'd have data governance as a capability and data literacy um, just below it, similar to how you'd have um, data quality below data management. On the people side of this, I really believe that it's a data literacy specialist in the data governance organization that really drives a, a data literacy program, but as you'll see in a subsequent slide, um, there's a whole lot more people involved in a data literacy program than just data governance. Having someone lead it from a data governance point of view, I believe makes a whole lot of sense, um, but they certainly cannot succeed alone. From a process perspective, um, again, there is a data governance process to kick this off, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit in, in a subsequent slide. But the actual learning path, learning development is outside of data governance. It's, I really believe that fits into an HR and a manager employee kind of relationship. Now, as you can see, I'm doing people, process, and technology to start off with. And technology is a hard one in, in the space of data literacy. Um, what, what kind of technology are we talking about? Well, if we think of technology as the, the learning management system or the subscriptions that you're using to deliver or the courses that people are going to, um, then in general, the technology is outside of the data governance realm. It really becomes, once again, an HR thing and a vendor management or possibly even a procurement thing. While standards are standards, I can't say that they really um, come outside of data governance, except in the space of those technology delivery tools. Um, I do believe you need to select standard um, learning channels and stick with them, or it, the program will get out of control on you. From an organization perspective, um, I believe that data literacy should be a, a standing topic in your data governance council, and, and you should have measures um, to show that. However, how that um, data is collected would be outside of data governance. So as you complete a course, you need to submit that in an HR tool or one of the platforms selected by human resources. And finally, a policy. Um, I'm, I'm in the belief that a data literacy program is something incredibly wise to make part of your data strategy. I know we haven't um, used that word yet today, but if you think about it, if you're about to make a multi-million dollar investment in your organization by modernizing your technology or your data um, environment, if you don't make literacy part of that engagement, 
part of that strategy, then you've missed out on the people side of this. You're going to have all these wonderful new tools, all this wonderful new data, but you're going to have a whole bunch of people that don't know how to use any of it. Um, so making sure that you write data literacy into policy, I think is incredibly important. And depending on which kind of organization you have, policy may or may not be inside your data governance program. Thanks for the thumbs up to everybody. So before I move on, any questions on this? Well, I'll keep an, um, a monitor on the chat while I go through. I promise to talk a little bit about who to involve. At the center of it, I really believe is your data governance, data literacy lead. It's very possible that the data governance lead and the data literacy lead are the same person, depending on the size of your organization. Um, I'll start picking on senior leaders. I, I believe they have a role in this, but they might not realize it. I, I believe that, oh, I see a question. Um, so I would say it, the answer is it's not just uh, chicken and egg. I, I call it just in time. So when you need training, it needs to be ready. Um, for the senior leadership, I think um, advocates and support and making them available, pardon, making resources available to the program is their job. Um, but they actually need to be taught that. They don't just know it. This isn't something that um, is uh, what, what I'll call common knowledge. So there, there's coaching that starts at the very beginning with senior leadership. And is that the data literacy person that has to do that? Or is that somebody that is more working on the data strategy overall? I think that's um, where that, that literacy comes from. I believe people managers need to support their employees through their learning journey. So make, and that means make sure they have budget, make sure they have time to learn. I believe that um, the participants, uh, obviously if they're engaged in this whole process, change management, um, there's, there's a lot of speed bumps along the way. And if you don't have a change management person in place to manage communications, read the, the culture and provide guidance, and even identify gaps because of other meetings that they're in, I believe that to be a pretty big gap. And a lot of people don't see change management as part of data literacy, but my goodness, is it ever important. I've talked about human resources a lot already. Um, and one area that I think gets um, uh, overseen a lot is you really need to establish a community of practice that includes um, subject area mentors. Um, sometimes the participants want help with a very specific problem and their education to date doesn't help because it's a very business specific problem that you're not going to, to find help with in a, in a course. So making those mentors available are very important. I promise to talk about how we make this work. My animations aren't quite as fancy as the last slide. First off, I think an organization needs to understand that there really is a need. So going back to the data strategy, hey, we're gonna have all of this cool new stuff. How do we make sure we know how to use it? Let's add that data literacy component to the data, data strategy scope and assign the work to the data governance organization for execution. Because it is overall their job to bring the right people together, manage the culture change, and build a data literate organization. So where there are gaps, I believe it really comes down to layering in HR, layering in technology, and layering in um, our change management folks. My key takeaways for today. It's more than just people, process, and technology. 
it's an individual and an organizational skill set. And that's really important. You have to measure both. From an, uh, from an employee's perspective, the participants, they're really under a microscope as they go through um, a data literacy program. It's really hard to um, execute this, learn something new, and then be expected to perform. The, 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 the pressure really is on. And just like data governance, if I call out a similarity, it's not just a project, it's a culture shift and it's, it's a journey. What makes this difficult, similar to data governance, is there isn't one way to do this. You have to understand um, what is the problem that your organization has to solve for your kind of data literacy pro problem going right back to my first page on my data literacy isn't your data literacy. That's it for me. Thank you, Josh. Um, this is Wendy, a quick question for you. When you're talking about literacy, um, in the analogy that I built where you just eat the food versus figure out how to put all the food together versus actually do some of the preparation. So, which is reading the data versus understanding how to put it into a report or a graphic or understand a table versus actually do some even basic analysis. When you talk about literacy, which of those levels are you thinking about? Or um, is it? All of them. It's all of them. It comes down to the problem that you're trying to solve for me. Um, I think a lot of organizations need to solve all of those problems, but one might be more important for the other in the moment. The, the, the problem is seeing the forest for the trees and making sure you have a real conversation on, um, uh, do, do we need to teach people how to find the data that they need? Mm -hmm. Do we need to teach people how to understand the data that they have? Or do we need to teach people how to analyze data or use um, a business intelligence tool or interpret data quality, whatever it might be? Okay. So all of the above is is where you where where you are thinking is that Absolutely. it may be it may be situation specific, but it's all of these levels. Yep. Okay. Well, we have a bunch of questions that we will get to, but right now I'm going to invite Bill to share his perspective from his experience working in both data literacy and data governance. All right. Hopefully you're seeing my screen. Let's see. Yes, we are. Let's see if I can see my screen. It's hidden by all the other things. All right. Um, so happy to be here. Thanks, Josh and Wendy, for kicking it off and uh, sharing uh, what you shared. I'm going to share from a perspective of starting off um, from ground zero with a data governance program and a data literacy program. Um, so um, I was working for a company called Online Insight and recognizing that we needed to use um, we were having problems with data. I wanted to address the problem systematically. So I thought, hey, let's do a data governance program. So I started learning about data governance and gearing up to uh, help our uh, my boss and the owner of our company, um, which was a small company with about 15 employees, to understand the importance of data governance. Uh, as I was gearing up to do that, we were purchased by a company that was about 10 times the size of us. And uh, when we were purchased by them, they already had um, some data governance in place. Um, so I was very excited about that. So they had a board of directors, they had financial backing, they were much more structured and formal. And uh, so when they purchased us, they had a data governance charter, they had a data governance committee with two co-chairs, they had a CEO who stated that data governance was important because they gave an all hands meeting to say, hey, welcome to the family and here are our goals for the next year. So that goal for 2022 was to improve data governance. So I said, cool, I don't need to make the argument. Now I can 
try to plug into this process. And uh, and I was plugged into it. Uh, we established a data governance team of myself, my boss, and one of the data engineers who was very interested. And I became another co-chair of that data governance committee. And uh, the data governance efforts were largely driven by the fact that we had gone through a high trust um, certification. So with high trust, the kind of idea was data governance is good. Let's do one. Um, <clears throat> so my title was changed to data governance officer. So I kind of had that responsibility. I was added to the data governance committee, like I said. Um, and here's a part that's in bold because we'll come back to the impact of this later. I was moved to the data technologies team in the other company, um, which was within IT. Uh, so my first responsibility was to create a roadmap for 2022 for data governance. So as this is happening, uh, we're kind of in 2022 while I'm doing this. And so they sent me to attend the DGIQ conference in San Diego in June of 2022. Uh, highly recommend a chance to go there. If you, you have an opportunity to go there, I learned a lot of stuff. So I was asked to make this roadmap. And this is the first copy of the roadmap. It's very pretty, you know, has some nice lines and channels in it. And you can see where we put the data literacy plan. Um, the top line there is just kind of overall data governance. And within that, there was the idea of the foundation. I wanted to revisit the charter and make sure the charter was accurate, create a communication plan. Um, Anyone with experience in creating a data governance program from scratch probably looks at this and goes, wow, this is overly ambitious. <laughs> and uh, that's what I would say is, uh, you know, I was naive at the time and uh, said, oh, sure, we can accomplish all this. We already have an infrastructure in place. We have a committee. We have a charter. We have uh, a CEO that's, you know, saying how important it is. So we can get this stuff off the ground. So I wanted to focus on all these different areas and understand from the areas there, you can see the asterisks on some of them that will or may need tools or services. So I was recognizing that with a small group of people trying to do this, just a team of three, that uh, we may need to leverage tools to help us do things more effectively and more efficiently. If we're trying to do data discovery by hand, by writing SQL queries and things like that, um, that's going to be less efficient than a tool that's made to do that for example. <clears throat> so I have that little picture in the upper right of the little boy with the airplane because it was very much like trying to build the airplane as you're flying it. So, you know, we're kind of cobbling this together and trying to figure out things and figure out definitions. And uh, I like how Josh pointed out that data literacy isn't data literacy um, <clears throat> because I often liken data governance to the Wild West and data literacy to the wild, wild west, because if you ask six people what the definition of data governance is, you'll get six different answers. But if you ask six people what the definition of data literacy is, you'll probably get 10 or 12 answers. It's uh, less well-defined. So that was our plan for 2022. And uh, it was a year of transition. There was a lot of stuff that we did get started, but there were things that we tried and that ended up stopping. So it, there were fits and starts. And, um, you know, tr it was hard to say that we made a lot of progress, but, you know, we were trying. So then the next year when we created a roadmap, you can see that we made five bullets. And one of those bullets was data literacy all by itself. So. What I really wanted to do was, as I'm launching a data governance program, I wanted to launch a data literacy program in parallel with that, because I didn't want to build this nice, robust data governance program and get these wonderful tools and then have people that don't know how to use those tools. Or like Wendy's analogy, not know how to choose something to eat or not know how to prepare the food. Um, I wanted to make sure that we were helping people in parallel with uh, the efforts that we were making, especially since some of those people were the people we're going to rely on as data stewards. So data literacy took on much more um, prominence. And so you can see the steps that we had there. We wanted to select a data literacy assessment <clears throat> and conduct a baseline assessment. 
And then based on the results of that, do some targeted training. This is uh, from my background as a trainer. Uh, it's kind of a very stock, old school approach. Uh, and then conduct a year end assessment. So that was kind of what we were looking at. So then how hard can it be <laughs> to just pick an assessment? Uh, it ended up being pretty hard. Uh, there wasn't consensus that data literacy was of primary importance, so we had to revisit the plan and, and continue to make the argument that data literacy was important even within our committee and our, our data, um, data governance group or team. So when we did decide, we evaluated five data literacy assessments and we couldn't agree on one, uh, so I created my own. Um, despite how great I thought it was, uh, what I did is I took our monthly um, operations reports, which had some graphs and data in it that people were using, and I took examples from there, and I did some analysis of it, and I wrote up some questions on, is there a way this could be improved, or what um, conclusions can you draw from looking at this, or is there any ambiguity or confusion in this one, and I thought it was pretty good. Um, but that wasn't universally accepted as a good way to approach it. So instead, I dropped back and I said, OK, I'm not going to fight this fight. There are many other things to do, so I'll go work on other things. So after doing that, another team member suggested, hey, let's do a maturity assessment. OK, that sounds good. So we selected an assessment from Oval Edge, which is a local company here in Atlanta, who was one of the three vendors that we had selected when we were doing tool selection. And uh, we selected one of the tabs to focus on. And I wasn't the one that drove this. You can probably guess which one it was, uh, since it's the one that circled there. They actually chose the data literacy tab, which I thought was wonderful and awesome. It's like, oh, okay, it's coming back around. So data literacy became the one that we started focusing on. This is an example, or this is the tab in the assessment and the questions that it has. So what we decided to do was send this out to the members of the data governance committee because the data governance committee meetings previously had been kind of reporting what we had done in the last quarter. And uh, that wasn't very interactive. And if that's all we're gonna do, we could just send an email out to let them know what we've done. So I wanted to make it more interactive so we sent this out two weeks ahead of time. We asked them to fill it out. We got about half of them back. We compiled the results. And then we went through it during that committee meeting to discuss these elements and try to figure out where we're at. Now, because we had done a kind of a merger and acquisition where they acquired us, we had kind of two different approaches or two different views of what these capacities were for each of the different sides of the business. Um, but it was a good discussion to have. And so now we have finally this baseline that we can use uh, to move forward. And so we synthesized the results of the assessment. Um, oh, I have synthesized on there twice. How about that? And uh, so we want to take the results of the assessment and then look at it through the views. Uh, there were three people. Peter Aiken and his book on data literacy, John Ladley, who has done some webinars and has this approach called data acumen, where he's kind of trying to rebrand um, data literacy. And then Wendy and her approach to analytic translators. And we're trying to look at it through three different lenses and just try to come up with what's gonna work best for us. Uh, Cause like Josh said, different companies are gonna use different approaches and then turn it all into a plan of action. So from all that, the lessons that we learned were that having data governance deep within IT has its drawbacks. So I was alluding to this earlier when I said there was that bold element um, because it's hard to have a voice or drive forward an initiative. Um, the farther down you are, the more consensus you have to build and spend time building that consensus in order to get things to move forward. So being farther up where you have more of a voice is uh, useful. Um, carefully consider what executive sponsorship means because you know they always say you should have executive sponsorship and that can look like different things at different times. So um, whether you have it or not, whether you can just go to the CEO and say, hey, CEO, I need some help uh, getting some visibility to this. 
Um, that's an important element that if you have executive sponsorship, you can you can leverage. And it seems generally accepted that data governance is important, data literacy less so. You know, anyone that I ask in our company is going to say, yes, data governance is important, even if they don't know exactly what it is or what it's going to do, but they'll say it's important. But when you say data literacy, uh, you have to make more of an argument for that to say, you know, but data literacy is an essential part of data governance that the data management relies on people who are able to um, cook the salmon. And uh, so uh, improving data literacy is even less well-defined than what data literacy is. Um, so I'm really glad to have um, started uh, to have found Wendy's um, approach to it, where it seems like a lower bar to be able to get people that can be analytic translators um, seems less daunting than trying to raise everyone up to a, you know, an A level of data literacy. Uh, depending on what their role is. And uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, that's an important element. We had to drop back and we started um, doing presentations at new hire employee, uh, new employee orientations about data governance. I did an all hands meeting about data governance. So we're starting to get the message out about what data governance is. And as we do that and kind of, you know, rattle the cage and get people involved, then we can introduce the idea of data literacy. And I think it has to be started early and in parallel with data governance efforts, or like Josh said, part of your data governance effort, uh, because it will take time to get people to get on board and for you to figure out how you're going to apply it in your uh, organization. So that is what I had. Thank you, Bill. So just one quick question. What is it that you think um, gets in the way for the experiences that you've had where people say, yes, governance is important, but literacy, uh, not sure. What What is it about literacy that is difficult for people to prioritize? I think it's like the example that you gave where people are making decisions based on data all the time. And those people that are making bad decisions about data don't know they're making bad decisions about data. So mm -hmm. I think people overestimate their ability to make decisions with data. When we look at our ops report and it has these graphs in it, I think people are impressed that we have graphs in it. And I don't think they're really looking at the details and saying, you know, what can I draw from this graph or how is it ambiguous or why do they have a mixture of things on here that don't make sense to be on here? So I think that may be a lot of it. They they overestimate their ability already to uh, make decisions with data. Wow. So some of their reluctance is either a, an ignorance about how much they do or don't know, or that they presume they already know, so they don't need it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Very good. So Josh, if you're still on, I think you probably are. Um, what, what about you? Do you think that uh, people accept governance more than they accept uh, literacy as a priority? As a priority, um, I have to think about that. I don't, I think literacy is just coming into the light. Hmm. But I also think people have been doing both without without realizing it. Mm, okay. And so in what way are they doing literacy without knowing that they're doing it? What, what, in what form does that take? Um, for example, with, with what Bill was just talking about going with Oval Edge, as you start to collect your metadata, you are naturally and organically increasing your literacy just by people having access to that tool. Mm, okay. So it, even though you're just trying to find out whether people are literate, just the measurement effect of somebody asking you about it gets you curious and, and you learn more about it. That's right. Got it. So Shannon, have you been looking at the questions? Do we have some questions we can direct to Bill or Josh or me? 
Absolutely. We got so many great questions coming in. So, and just answer some of the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording, along with anything else requested throughout. So diving in here, and I'll just open it up for any of you um, and all of you to answer. Uh, is it is a before and after individual sentiment questionnaire a good KPI for data literacy improvements? For me, I would say the after is really important for the participant, but I would add that you need that participant's manager to actually also get um, the opportunity to provide feedback and whether or not they saw an improvement in their employee. What about you, uh, Bill? What do you think? Um, I think like anything, you want to quantify it as much as possible. You know, we're talking about data, so we want to have data. So we don't want it to be anecdotally that, yes, we're better at data literacy. We want to try to measure it somehow so that we can demonstrate improvement. Right. And I saw that the measure that you had about maturity really was more about the organizational structure. It felt like organizationally were certain things put in place, not necessarily um, the individual. Is that is that true? I'd say that's accurate, yes. Okay, all right. What else have you got for us, Shannon? Oh, we have a data governance program and a data governance committee, but it is staffed entirely by people who have other full-time jobs. Governance responsibilities fall under the quote unquote other duties as assigned category for everyone, including the uh, data governance council co-chairs. So can you speak to managing data literacy in the context of an all volunteer governance structure? And I know Josh, you were you were um, typing some of this in the in the chat there too, but uh, I want to get everyone's opinion on that. And yeah, maybe Josh, sure. you can reiterate. I, I apologize for the typing. I'm still learning. No, 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 uh, good. Yeah. So for everybody to hear the answer, I really think the the secret sauce to that situation or any situation in data governance is you, is really three elements. You need to embed your data governance and data management outcomes in your project delivery process. So as you build new, as you change, you are building everything into it. From a, um, uh, a business case perspective, top down, people need to understand and truly um, win over hearts and minds and and put in a role or a group of people to complete the, that data governance function. <laughs> But very often, if, if you're struggling to get past the first two, then bringing in someone from the outside who has that energy, that passion, and um, can get people excited about data governance to help um, hit a home run with the business case and, and kickstart and, and accelerate your program, that helps a lot. Just bringing somebody in from the outside for a couple of weeks just to get things going. Bill, do you have a uh, another thought? I know you you were officially assigned, but um, in the first job before you were acquired, you were um, not necessarily as official. Is that true? Right. Um, I, I think that you know um, Robert Siner wrote that book about non invasive data governance, and I think um, that's kind of the approach that's important because just like Every company is already doing data governance. They just are doing it informally and, and not realizing that's what they're doing. So by the same token, there are already data stewards in your organization. There are already people that are, you know, interacting with data. So it's just a matter of having them realize, you know, this amount of time that you're already spending is doing this job. And, you know, we work in healthcare. So every year we have to take, you know, HIPAA training and HIPAA, you know, we have to pass HIPAA tests to show that we know what it is. And it would be similar to kind of adding that to the other duties as assigned to add uh, data literacy testing or something like that to say, you know, this is just a, a half hour training or test that you need to take just to see what level you're at. Um, so I think integrating it in, in small chunks um, may be helpful. That's a really great answer. I like that. What else have we got, Shannon? Yeah, anything, Wendy, you want to add to that? No. Okay. I, uh, I, I think these two gentlemen have, have far, <laughs> more, far more experience in governance than I do. 
<laughs> well, so is data literacy a useful label? Do we really want to tell the business folks we are trying to attract that they are illiterate? Um, I'll, I will take that one. I think it's a horrible label. Um, <laughs> and I don't think it's the appropriate one in discussions with the people we are trying to attract. Um, I don't know that we can get away from that term when it comes to discussing the overarching efforts that in, that companies are making, but I am not certain at all that we ought to be using that word. Um, and so however we, we want to do it, it should probably have a positive um, spin on it. And we can talk about people being good consumers of information and getting better at those things. And I, I think that going on the positive side would be much better than the, the literacy does have just a really tough connotation. And I just saw Maria put in her um, suggestion in the chat, data awareness. There's there's so many good terms that we could have, awareness uh, and safety, and there's a whole variety of things depending on what industry you're in to make parallels with it. Data engagement, Heather just um, mentioned, and Heather was our pre presenter last time when it came to assessment. Yeah, even data mastery doesn't have that negative connotation. If you're not a master, you're like, oh, okay, I'm not a master, but I can become one. Mm -hmm. And I, it's similar to data governance, I try not to put a name on it. So if if we're doing data governance, I'll, or pardon me, data quality, for example, I'll ask a, the work group that I've been given, hey, who, who here has done data governance before? Um, one out of five people might might say that they have and said, okay, well, I'll do a quick presentation to give you an introduction to data governance and then we'll get things going from there. I'm not using the concept of data literacy at all. I'm yeah, doing data I, literacy, um, but I'm not calling it out. Yes. And I just saw a suggestion, data mavericks. Everybody wants to be a maverick. <laughs> yes. Data partners. Those are all really good words, but yes, I agree. Um, with that question. I think literacy is a tough one. I love it. So um, there's a, a question here and a request for the, all the books that mentioned in the presentation, and we'll get that in the follow-up email. I'll get those from you all. Um, and so, uh, but, and we've got just a few minutes left here. So in three minutes, if we can get everybody's elevator pitch here, I see data literacy as a component or pillar of data governance. So why are we separating them? Um, I do think that there, um, it it can if I can describe it in terms of the analogy that I used, um, I do think they are separate but very connected responsibilities. And when we are talking about the consumers getting better and better at understanding it, it's not that they can't use it without understanding it, but it is a much more comprehensive and thoughtful and appropriate kind of use when they are able to understand it. But I think that some of the governance um, has to be centralized uh, with people who do it day in and day out. But I would love to hear, um, Bill, what do you think? Oh, such a good question. Um, I think it depends on who you're focusing on, who your audience is. Um, and, and who's in charge of it. Like Josh said, it may be the same person in charge of both data governance and data literacy, um, but maybe your organization's big enough to have someone who can spearhead data literacy efforts. Um, so then you might want to separate them more. And I'll, I'll kind of take the point that we, we what Wendy delivered earlier in the, in the discussion, they're <laughs> measured differently. Data governance has different metrics than data, data literacy. You can't use the same metric for each. So that's why technically I separate them. Um, and my view is data governance is on top and data literacy is a part of data governance or component of it. Yeah, and I don't think I I don't think we're disagreeing that it is a key component. Yeah. But yeah. I, I do think that they are separate in terms of, of who they're directed toward. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 
Makes a lot of sense. And that brings us right to the top of the hour. Well, Wendy, thank you so much as always. And Bill and Josh, thank you so much for joining us this month. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the insights. Glad to, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you as always, Shannon. Oh, thank you guys. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love it. Thank you for all the comments and chats and throughout. Uh, and just again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of the webinar, along with the books um, that were mentioned. So thanks, y'all. Have a great, great day. Thank you. Talk to you soon.